Hello, everyone, and happy International Women's Day. Um, welcome to our special Moving Forward session on Women in Leadership. My name is Muneeb Sayed, and I'm the Associate Director of Advancement for the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies. On uh, behalf of our uh, host, Lily Cho, uh, welcome to the session. Uh, Lily will be joining us shortly to do the land acknowledgement and carry on with the webinar. Um, on her behalf, I'm just going to be delivering a few remarks at the beginning. Um, according to a recent survey by, uh, by Grant Thornton, 36% of senior management positions in Canada are held by women, uh, were held by women in 2021, which actually increased from 20, 2018 when only 25% of uh, positions in senior leadership were held by women. It is great to hear that, but however, there is a lot of distance to be covered. And in an effort to address some of this, the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies has launched a special program called Advancing Women, uh, which is designed to provide mentorship, personal and skills, uh, personal development and skills development to third and fourth year women students in an undergraduate program. If we will be posting a link with more details in the chat shortly. Now back to the main event. Um, during the next hour, you will be hearing from three senior leaders uh, who are doing amazing uh, things in their professions. And uh, they are going to be talking about how they have shattered the glass ceilings to earn their senior management positions. And they will be sharing their journey with you, talk about what inspires them on a daily basis and answering your questions as well. If at any time you need help with your experience or have any questions, for the panelists about the content, please click the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen uh, to submit your questions and or submit your comments. And now I will pass it back to Lily, uh, pass it to Lily Cho to do the land acknowledgement and carry on with the webinar. Thanks so much, Maneeb. And hello, everybody. I'm so thrilled to be here. And uh, thank you for joining us. This is such an important day around the world. Uh, and I know there are so many things happening that we want to observe and uh, give space to and hold grief for, frankly, but also to celebrate. And I am delighted to be here with you today and to be joined by our distinguished panelists. Before we begin, I do want to acknowledge that uh, the land that we are on and, uh, and I do so as an Associate Dean for Global and Community Engagement here in the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies. And in that capacity, the land that I'm meeting with you on is, uh, is at York University and in Toronto. This meeting is virtual, and because of that, we are not all actually gathered in the same space. York's land acknowledgement might not represent the territory that you are currently on. And I would ask if that is the case, that you each take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory that you are on and its current treaty holders. As I noted, I myself am situated in the area known as Tacaronto, and so gratefully acknowledge that I live on the same territory as York University. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been taken care of by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Thank you. And now I would like to introduce our panelists. And what I'm going to do is invite each panelist to turn their camera on and join us on this virtual stage in turn. And, uh, and once I call you up onto our virtual stage, distinguished panelists, please stay, um, introduce yourselves uh, and, and tell, tell us a little bit about yourself and then I will invite the next speaker on. So the first speaker that I am so honored to invite onto our virtual stage is Darren Rizzi. Darren, could you please join us on our virtual stage? Thank you. Hello, thank you for having me. My name is Darren Rizzi. So I'm the fire chief of the Mississauga Fire and Emergency Services. And I also serve as the director of emergency management. 
I oversee a team of 741 people. And I'm also proud to say that I am uh, still with York University as a PhD candidate. Thank you so much, Darren. Um, our next panelist is Marsha Green. Marsha, could you please join us on the virtual stage? Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Marsha Green. I am a TV writer and producer, also known as a showrunner. Uh, I am currently the showrunner of a series called The Porter, which is on uh, CBC at uh, 9 p.m. on Mondays um, and will be on BET Plus in May in the US. And I'm also the council vice president for the Writers Guild of Canada and the chair of its diversity and inclusion committee. Thank you so much, Marsha, um, and bravo on, on all, and Darren and Marsha. I don't, I don't wanna say all these things, but you know what? Let me, let me invite Sharon onto the stage first because I'm just so excited to have all of you here. Sharon, can you please, um, yes, here you are, um, welcome. Well, thank you so much. It's great to be here. Uh, yeah, so my name's Sharon Zohar. I'm the founder and CEO of The Big Push. Uh, the Big Push is a business accelerator for women entrepreneurs. And we provide professional services and access to capital for women-led businesses to help them get through to their next growth of, um, of state, next stage of growth. Um, and I'm really excited to be here and to hear from all of the other women on the panelists here tonight. Okay, that is, I, I'm already so thrilled and so excited by, by all of you here, by your accomplishments. I have so many questions for you. And, but, but first, I just actually want to acknowledge, you know, the achievements that you already have given you, you've all been very humble in your introductions to each other. And I know we said, you know, do, you know, say what you want to, and I won't belabor um, the point because I know we have limited time, but I do encourage everyone in the room and people in our audience now and on YouTube later to look at the bios again for our panelists because their achievements are so extraordinary and we are just so lucky, lucky to be in the room with you today. Uh, but let me let me throw a question out just to get us started. And I wanted to think about how, you know, given the current global climate that we're in, can you talk a little about any particular experiences that have shaped your idea of leadership and what it means to you? And uh, in fact, I'm going to just do that teacher thing where I, I, I call on somebody and, <laughs> and then I'll, I'll, I'll riff from there so there's no awkward silences. Uh, Darren, I wonder if you could start for us, please. I think the concept of, of leadership is evolving all the time for me and my understanding of leadership. But if I, if I take a look at it, I'm in the public service sector. So obviously service excellence. Um, and when I talk about service excellence, that's to our citizens and also you know, to our internal uh, stakeholders, which is our firefighters, that's of utmost importance. Um, and that's certainly what I've learned about is, is about servant le leadership and, and giving of oneself. And certainly when you're a fire chief, um, you know, emergencies can happen 24-7, um, 365 days a week. So certainly I'm engaged uh, in my profession at all times. But that is something that I've learned is just the engagement piece. And, and certainly as a fire chief, um, I think it's important to engage in, in terms of citizen safety, and that's through uh, influencing legislation. So if you're looking at provincial legislation or national legislation as it relates to fire code, and then on firefighter safety side, there's also uh, legislation there such as uh, presumptive legislation and, um, and firefighter elevators. Those are two fairly recent pieces of legislation that, that I would have um, added some some commentary on and so just in terms of leadership then I think it's very important to be engaged in your profession and to offer input insight and uh, your opinion frankly to help influence uh, positive changes in the future thank you so much Darren and I think as I'm listening to you talk about what leadership means and how it works in your field you know I think a lot about the the dialogic like, like there's a dialogue you know where, where you know sometimes we think about leadership as just someone on top telling people what to do <laughs> and and a lot of what you are telling me right now i think is that leadership involves uh a lot of conversation um and a lot of collaboration and recognizing that there are hierarchies and, and I think your profession has a very clear hierarchy, um, but, but, but also understanding how 
there can be moments of fluidity um, or, or, or deep collaboration even within that hierarchy. And, and I think that that's, you know, incredibly powerful. And, uh, and, and Marsha, like I think a lot about the work you do where you have to uh, bring so many people into this operation <laughs> and, uh, and, and coordinate them all to do the same thing at the same time so that everything comes together. But you're also lobbying externally. You're also so that there there is also that I, I think in some ways like a, a very interesting overlap in terms of how leadership might move, I think, in your field at, at both, you know, if I could put it that way, like, um, I don't know, vertically and horizontally uh, in a way. Is, is that something that resonates with you? Yeah, absolutely. It is a very, you know, when we think about being a showrunner, it's really about keeping a keeping a vision for the series, for having that vision. But it's also really important, I think, to empower all of, if you're on set, like all of your department heads and whatever, because everybody is kind of a leader in their in their own right, in their own um, in their own profession. And so uh, yeah, so it, it's a bit of a balancing act. This is such an interesting question. When I, when I heard it, the, but the first things that came to mind to me when I thought about how leadership was changing in this climate was um, accountability, transparency, and engagement. And I think I think about that in kind of a larger sense of leadership, like all around the world, just the uh, desire now. But just being a person who has, you know. Um, advanced to having a seat at the table, I am very aware of like our kind of natural instinct to hold things back. And in fact, I think we need to share more. I think we need to be accountable for the things we do, the mistakes we make and the achievements we have. And I think we really need to engage people in our communities, in our professions to help us to help make us uh, better leaders. Thank you so much, Marsha. And, and Sharon, I'm listening to these things and I'm thinking about the work you do and how in some ways you not only articulate and embody leadership, but you also have to push you know, the people you work with to constantly articulate their idea of leadership too. Um, but I, so I wonder if you wanna to speak to any of those things. Yeah, I mean, a lot of what, uh, well, let's just kind of call everything out. I mean, there's a lot of ambiguity in the world right now. You know, people are so unsure of the future, how they'll work even, what that function looks like for them, you know, given the whole global, global climate that we're looking at. So what I came across, you know, certainly during the pandemic, I came across so many worried and anxious people, you know, within the organization, with those within our portfolio, and everyone that I've sort of basically touched upon. And I think the problem is that they're not sure about how to go about their business, how to go, you know, business as usual. And so this is where leadership really, I find, really steps in. And it's about really listening. It's about all of the empathy. It's about understanding that we're all people in this really unsure place. And I think that's one of the most important aspects of leadership during this time. I mean, there's all the aspects of transparency and support and, and um, but I think it's also about flexibility, about recognizing that people are going through a lot of things, mental health issues, uh, financial issues, uh, whatever is impacting them is something that kind of goes beyond their workforce and into their private lives. So as leaders, I think we have to learn to be human, to recognize that ourselves and others and uh, to essentially want to be treated the way they're, they, uh, we would want to be treated and supported. Thank you so much, Sharon. And as I was listening to all of you talk, one of the things that I was thinking about was I like, I, I have this vague recollection as an undergraduate student of receiving a leadership award, you know, in the 90s. And it was really nice. It was really nice to get it. But I remember actually thinking, I really don't know what I did to get like, I didn't really understand why um, the things that I had done as a student, for example, might be identified as leadership. Uh, it wasn't entirely clear to me, you know, I, was, I took part in student groups, I took part in student life, but, uh, but there was that word leadership wasn't something that I had connected to the work I was doing. And I wonder if there was a moment, for, and, and sorry, and I, and I think about it again in, in different moments in my life where like, I was offered a promotion or something. And then all of a sudden I would look around and think, oh, like, does this mean I'm a grown up leader now? Like I, I, I really, you know, and, and it seemed very iterative. Like there were many moments where I would look around and think, okay, is, is this the, the leader moment? Uh, and I, so I wonder for you, if, if there was a moment where you in your careers had a like if there was a light bulb moment where you thought I I'm a leader right I am a leader now of people and uh, and 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 
and I embody leadership. Like, I don't know, or, or, or if there was a sort of more external process where that happened. I, I don't know. I, I'm very, very curious because it's, it's just a, it's a word that we don't take up a lot when we talk to people about, um, especially when we talk to students about, you know, their careers and their curricula and the courses they should take, you know, that kind of thing. Um, Marsha, I wonder if I could ask you to, to, to start us off on that moment. Like, was there a moment where you're like, I am a leader or, <laughs> or, or, or where leadership suddenly became very real for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had become, I had gotten a project which was in development. So basically you um, have a development writer's room to kind of flesh out the story more and then you try and sell it um, and get a green light. And so I was the showrunner of the project. It was the first, it was my first one. <laughs> so cute. And um, and so I was, I had, I had this writer's room, I think of like five people. And so we were like pitching ideas and like, you know, kind of working on story and, you know, we were kind of circling around various things and then it just got quiet and we were all sitting there, including me. And I realized it's because this is the point where the showrunner says, okay, this is the idea we're going to go with. And I, and that was me. Like, but I had, I was just so used to being in a writer's room and just being collaborative, being in the process that like <laughs> got quiet and everybody was waiting for me to say, oh, this is the thing we're going to do now. And that was when I realized, oh, it's my job now. I'm not just kind of like in this room. And, um, and I feel like, I feel that a lot, you know, for so much of the time you're just working and, and advancing um, and, and trying to advance. And you don't really realize that at some point it's like, you know, you've arrived certainly because we're always going to the next job and the next job. So that was definitely the moment when I realized. I, I love that anecdote. And as you see, I have a live audience in the room with me. <laughs> so not speaking in a vacuum at all. Um, but um, not, not, not to say any of you are vac vacuum. -y. I know this is not going to work. But anyhow, what I do want to say, Marsha, but what I really, really, I mean, I love so much about what you've just said there. And, and one of the things that, that really struck me uh, was that moment of silence. And I, I think that sometimes we think of leadership or we're given an idea of leadership as a kind of noisy thing, you know, where you, you talk a lot and you take up space and you make yourself big. Um, but in fact, there, you know, what, what you've articulated there is that there can be in leadership and the recognition of leadership actually important silences where you step into the silence. Um, and, and that even that moment of silence is something to honor and hold. And, and I really, you know, I, I, I quite love that. So, so thank you for that. And for, for the whole story there. Um, Sharon, I, I wonder if I could invite you to, to tell us about your thoughts on that. If there was a moment where you thought, okay, I'm, I'm a leader. <laughs> yeah, I mean, very similar as well to Marsha. I think what happens is and as well, you know, alluding to the, the idea of listening. So when you're in an environment, leadership can happen in any space in, in, in high, in high school and university throughout your life, you find yourself in being a leader in certain areas where you're just collaborating with people, listening, being having bring the space, and when it's that moment in time where there is a decision making. So when so I, I was in a, a couple of instances where uh, we would open up the conversation and you know try to head towards a towards towards an end pro, you know end goal. Let's identify something. Uh, in particular, when I was building up the big push, I have uh, my founding membership, and there were ten of us and. Um, I took leader, leadership just sort of naturally because of the, 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 the passion that drew me. So a lot of leadership comes from within in terms of a passion that drives you and where you see your North Star. Often leaders really have a sense of where they want to go uh, and want to bring people along on that journey. And so as I was asking these questions, I still had sort of my, my, um, my central belief of where I wanted to be. And, and then everybody was turning to me as, at that point and saying, okay, so how are we gonna get there? And you know, how are we gonna drive through? And so it was really wonderful how people sort of popped in. At that moment, I realized I loved the collaboration. I loved bringing it all together. It was like a puzzle. And then I realized we can roll the ball forward. So I don't, I don't know if that really kind of talks to it, but it felt like somebody in the room had, had the vision forward and everyone alongside came on board to, to um, to embrace that vision. So that was that was a great experience. I Sharon, that's so great because part of what you've identified there, and it came up a few times in in, in what you just said, is the idea of vision. And so so you reckon you had to recognize at some point that part of your recognition of your role as a leader 
was to provide vision <laughs> and, and, and that and that at some point, no matter how collaborative the process was, uh, you had to make some choices. Someone had to make choices and they are built around um, a collective vision, but also something quite singular that you provide. And I think understanding the balance between working collectively, working collaboratively, but also being the person who has to make decisions in a key moment uh, seems to me so important for, you know, for those of us who are thinking about the leadership roles that we're in, but also everyone out there who's looking to step into leadership roles, you know, that this is something that's going to happen to you, you know, that you're going to want to work with people and be empathetic and be collaborative, but also like understanding that there's a moment where someone will have to make some tough decisions. Uh, Darren, does, that, does any of this resonate with you? Does it call to any of your experiences of understanding this moment where you think, okay, I am a leader. I mean, at least you have a title where you're chief. <laughs> and, so I, and so I think about that um, and, and what it means to sort of move through your world in, in that in, in that title, but also in that role and, and anything else that might connect with what you're experiencing. I just think it's such a journey, right? And you get so um, focused on the journey and it's much like a labyrinth. It's not a very linear, linear path, right? And then Sometimes you you hit a door of opportunity and it won't open. So you look for another door and you're so, you know, focused on on how you're moving through this journey. Um, but I think for for me in terms of when I sort of acknowledged that I had uh, made a name for myself in the fire service was when I was elected as the vice president for the Ontario Association of Fire Chiefs and I was elected by my colleagues and, and so that I was representing the chief officers from about 441 uh, departments in the province and, and that's yeah that is huge right to be um, embraced and accepted by your peers and to be selected to be their voice um, at, at a provincial level so I think that was that was pivotal for me in terms of being embraced by my colleagues, obviously being embraced by your department. But then the next step was being embraced uh, by the community, right? And, um, and certainly sometimes that can be a little bit more difficult because you can prove yourself in terms of your technical expertise, operational expertise, logistical expertise, but out in the, the public, um, they might not recognize or um, embrace that. So I just, two, two points that I remembered, it was uh, a vendor had called me and he was tucking his daughter in to bed and she had a device with her. And he said, she said, uh, his daughter had said, oh, she's so cool. And he went to look at the device and she was on Twitter and she was looking at a post that I recently had done. And he phoned me and told me about that. Wow. And that's when I was, and she was young, like nine or 10. And I'm thinking, why would she follow a fire chief? Like, I don't think I say anything that's reasonably, you know, relatable to a nine or a 10 year old. But that's when I realized I, I am influencing other people. And in a similar circumstance in which uh, a firefighter, in another municipality, his daughter had drawn a picture of me. And then, so you're starting, and I get it, these are, these are people within the fire service world that are exposing their daughters to someone like myself, and that is being of influence to them. But I'm realizing, you know, that I am making a, an impact on very young people's lives. That is so beautiful, Darren. And I, 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 as you were talking, I was thinking about, you know, when my daughter was little and I would read those Richard Scarry books with her, which, you know, like, what do grown ups do all day? And there would be these animals in various costumes, you know, inhabiting careers. And we, you know, I, I know it seems sort of simple at some level, but it makes such a huge difference to be able to see different faces and different people in the roles that we uh, are that we are shown even from very very um, early stages in our lives, you know. So what it means to see who a fire chief should be uh, really is transformative, and that's. But 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 when I what, in that story, I mean, and there's so many parts of that. Like I don't want to lose sight of the the peer recognition, but also the recognition from a, a different generation uh, of of. Of people and young women in particular and how important and meaningful those moments are and you don't look for them um, but they are moments where you suddenly realize that you uh, are someone who isn't you know is leading but is also mentoring 
Uh, and, and I think that that brings me to, to my next question. Uh, one of the things that I, I get asked a lot in, you know, in these webinars, but in other arenas also is, is, is about mentorship. And in the context of today and this very special day that we're in, where we are recognizing women around the world and celebrating you and your achievements, you know, I wonder if, if you could tell us a little bit about your sense of the relationship between leadership and mentorship. And, you know, you've all spoken to the need for empathy, for leading with empathy, this idea of servant leadership, the idea of seeing people and meeting them where they are. Um, but I wonder if, if there's a piece of that that's also about mentorship for you. Um, and so, you know, please take from that any piece that you would like, um, you know, whether or not you'd like to speak to the way you were mentored or whether or not leadership and mentorship are really intertwined for you or separate, any any, any part of that, um, I'd be really curious to hear about. Uh, and, and Sharon, I wonder if I could ask you to start us off in this, in this round here. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I do see mentorship and leadership uh, different. I mean, sort of kind of the same. They're, 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 they're definitely twins in some ways. So when I think about mentorship, I think about uh, it's a two way street. It's we, we get a lot from each other when we provide that kind of support. So as a mentor, um, it's really a navigator, somebody sort of who's by your side, a confidant, a friend who shares the experiences and kind of tells you like as you're driving down that highway ahead of time, oh, you know, there's a sign over there. If you want to get off, I'll let you know. <laughs> you know, it's someone there by their by your side who kind of recognizes and knows through experience what has happened in the past and could be possibly be ben beneficial to you. So it's really a, a sharing of experience, uh, someone who can really be there to explore not only your in your personal in your professional life, but in your personal life too. So it's really an expansion of, of your of your whole sense of where you want to go in this world, what you want to achieve, and um, and essentially a soundboard too. And I think the, the, the flip side to that is what the mentee, the, you know, mentoring someone, you always get something back as well, because not always do you, you have, there's always weaknesses with everybody, there's always gaps somewhere. And so when you often, when I mentor people, mentor uh, a lot of women-led businesses, a lot of uh, uh, women professionals, they, uh, they teach me constantly about, you know, what, this, what areas that I'm at most weak at or some areas of how I can build my businesses better. So it's always a two-way street. As far as leadership goes, leadership really kind of focuses in within the organization and within what, again, back to the vision of where, of really moving it forward. And um, as a leader, you work in helping lift up your, your professionals, your people within your organization to really all in a, in, in, in a cohesive way kind of go towards the same goal. Uh, whereas mentorship is really supporting whatever the goals or whatever the, um, whatever sort of floats up in that moment between a mentor and mentee. Thank you so much, Sharon. And, and I, I love the connection you're making between these two ideas, you know, mentorship and leadership. And, and Darren, I wonder if you, if, you know, again, you know, you, you've already told, you've told us so much about how, how you're engaging, you know, with the world that you're in. But I wonder if, if any of that is different when we think about it through the lens of the relationship between leadership and mentorship. So I was, I was listening to Sharon and, and I completely agree in terms of mentorship being this it's, it's very uh, much built on communication and dialogue, and it's very personal. And you have to be prepared when you're a mentor to be very, um, look, at, look at your experiences in, in a true light in terms of acknowledging your failures, acknowledging what you learned from those failures, taking a step back and, and acknowledging what you could have done different or what you should have done differently, and then providing that information, but certainly, it, it is a, a two-way street, as Sharon mentioned, in terms of you're providing information to that person, which hopefully they'll utilize it in, in a productive uh, way, but you're also reflecting on your own personal lessons learned and hopefully building from that on a go forward, where leadership can be a little bit um, of an illusion, right? And, and you've heard of this you know, fake it until you make it and you're creating this brand and you're showing people what you want to show them in terms of, you know, this is who I am as a leader and this is what I want to share with you. Um, but it's, it's guarded. Certainly, I think uh, leadership is quite guarded. So I think it's two very different things. One is, uh, is you're putting it all a mentorship, you're putting it all out there um, without the worry of someone judging. They're just trying to learn from that. But 
but leadership, especially, you know, fire service, police, police service, that sort of thing, you have to demonstrate that you have it together because you're trying to build confidence of the community, right? I, 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 I find this so illuminating and, and, and the ways in which the, what you've both brought to the table is, you know, the balance between leadership and mentorship. And uh, Marsha, does this does does this follow in terms of your experience of the connection between leadership and mentorship? It really does. I thought about it. I was thinking about uh, Sharon's road metaphor, and it was thinking, you know, if as a leader, you know, I'm like kind of, you know, I'm in the front and I'm like leading people like down the path, you know, using my, it's my own judgment and my own instincts and, and what I think is right. Whereas if I'm mentoring someone, particularly if I'm mentoring a writer, I'm, I'm giving them my experience, but the work has to be their own. And so it's not so much like I'm saying, this is what I'm saying, you know, this is what I would do, or this is a way to do it, but it is much more um, collaborative. And, and then the person might say to me, oh, oh, I, that doesn't feel right to me, or I want to do something else. I wanted to, I want to, I'm like, you should go right. And they say, I want to turn left. And then I'm working with them to figure out, okay, well, if we're going to turn left, what does that mean? And where does that go? And so in that sense, it's like, I'm also being, what I like about it um, is that it's so easy to get into a rut in a way of thinking, you know, when you do something over and over again. So it's it's very rewarding to mentor people because I think it just forces you to to be like, yes, I always go right, but what if I went left? And and what does that mean? As you help this other person, you really can get a lot out of it. So I think you, you know, people, they want you to be a, a, their mentor because you're a leader, but I do think it is actually quite helpful to have that. I think this is kind of what Darren's saying too, you know, it's, it is like you're, you're kind of getting something from, from it as well, that that is helping you become an even better leader. Thanks so much, Marcia. And you, you just reminded me of, of something, you know, for, for those in the audience, we, we had met earlier just to talk about this event and some of the questions. And I remember in our previous conversation, we talked a lot about how, you know, mentorship isn't a one-way street, you know, that it's not, you as this leader with this giant body of knowledge that you're going to somehow, you know, <laughs> transmit down to the mentee, but that for all of us our, in our experiences of leadership, um, one of the things that we value is the, uh, is the possibility of learning always from the people we work with, including the people we mentor and, and how important that is. Uh, and, and so thank you for, for, for bringing bringing my head back to that moment, which I which I really value from all of you. I, I, I want to ask a question, which I, I think we're going to move towards in the Q&A, but it, it, but it was something that, you know, we had also talked about earlier. And it, there's always a moment for me when, when I meet with our amazing alum where I think about what, you know, looking back on what you've done and thinking ahead to the generation of, of people, in particular young women coming forward, uh, uh, what advice you might have for uh, for the next generation of women leaders who are in our audience today? What would you say to our students, um, to the people who are maybe uh, more newer alum <laughs> who are who are joining us, who are looking at you as people who have arrived in many many ways? Um, what what might you say to them in terms of where they are in their journey? Uh, what you might have done differently? Uh, just just any thoughts or advice? And uh, and, and in fact, Darren, I'm going to ask you to start there if that's all right. <laughs> No, that's a, that's a tough one, right? I have two yeah. teenage daughters. One's in university. One's about to enter university, and and certainly I I always get nervous on International Women's Day because a lot of times we focus on professional success, and and certainly I think we need to understand success in someone's life doesn't necessarily have to be professional success. It could be how they're con uh, contributing in the community, how they're uh, contributing in a, a space of arts and culture, like there's so many different variations of what um, success and contribution looks like. And it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, the certificates on a wall and it doesn't have to be a title or a rank. And, and so certainly it's, it's about being happy with your personal growth and how you're contributing to the greater good in society. 
um, and how you're paving a way in the, in the future for other people to do the same. Thanks so much, Darren. Uh, Marsha, do you, do you have thoughts on this advice for future leaders in our room? Uh, yeah, that's such a good answer that <laughs> Darren gave. Um, I, I, what I was thinking that I wish I knew before, or uh, yeah, I wish is that like, I'm a bit of a, I was like a bit of a school junkie. You know, I, I went to York, I went to Humber, I went to CFC, you know, like my feeling was I needed to, you know, take all of these courses and get all of this like specific knowledge in order to be a leader. But in fact, what I found in being a leader is that actually, you know, your instincts and your vision are, are the most important because you can learn all of these other things on the job or from other people and you can take courses or whatever. But, you know, when you are certainly as a, as a creator, as an artist, it's like that is the thing that you have to impart to people. And, and you need to be confident in that and you need to be confident that that's enough and you don't need to be right. I mean, it isn't, it's subjective, you know, art is subjective. So it's not really a question of, are you making the right creative choice? You're making your creative choice. That's your job. That's what, you know, that's what they've hired you to do and that's all you can do. And so it can be very difficult to trust your own instincts, particularly when you're starting out. But I, in fact, I think that is the best, that is the way to become the best leader. And the times that you're wrong, even those kind of help you along the way. That's my advice. Thanks so much, Marsha. So trust your instincts. Keep, you know, don't stay open. Know that there are lots of paths out there. There isn't, you know, as Darren says, one route, one set of, you know, stairs or steps that you take, not just one set of pieces of paper or documents that you need. Um, and, and, and that, I think that's really important for, for all of us to hang on to. And Sharon, do you have, do you, do you want to jump in on this? Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I think mine's more tactical in the sense that like, I think one of the biggest things is don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to ask for meetings. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, we often kind of think about, oh, I can't reach out to this person because he might be in a, uh, or he or she might be in a, in a different type of leadership position. So m my advice is, you know, at the end of the day, people really do want to help. And there is, it, whether it's your professor or Elon Musk, I mean, if you want a meeting with someone, uh, the best thing to do is uh, there is there is the responsibility on your part as well, of course, is to be to ensure why you want to meet with that person to understand what what is the value that you can give them just as much as they can give you to be prepared and do the research and to understand who this person is and, you know, why you want to have this engagement because people's time is important as well. But to never sort of shy away from the opportunities of meeting with people because networks you will find out will be sort of the opening for that future leader that will be inside of you, so. Sharon, I really love that answer and the, the practical part of it, because I, I will say that I have had, and I hear this from, from friends in other sectors, from law and elsewhere, you know, that they, they are always happy to meet with a younger person to talk about questions in the field, about how to um, move through the world, basically. Um, but, but there are moments where those meetings are terrible because the person, for example, just talked about themselves the whole time, even though it was, you know, they were asking for her mentorship, you know, and they thought, well, you're 22 and you've asked me to meet with you to tell you about this thing. So you shouldn't, you know, let's let's try to think through how this should not be mapped out. And I think that that very practical advice, you know, where, yes, you know, don't be shy, don't hesitate to reach out, you know, use these networks, use um, the alumni networks that we put together, for example, even through these webinars, but also do your research and know what you want from that conversation and be be prepared to listen and not and listening is not passive either. You know, think about how you're going to give as you listen. And I think those are really, really powerful pieces of advice for the folks in our room and the folks who will join us later in um, you know, via our YouTube channel. I am going to I open up the floor now to questions from our audience. We have a few and they're awesome. Uh, and the uh, I'm also going to ask my colleague, Maneeb, to help us uh, with navigating these questions. Maneeb, thank you so much. And I will be back um, in the room with you shortly. Maneeb, you are our Q&A host. 
Thank you, Lily. And thank you, Darren, Marsh, and Sharon, for such insightful conversation. So we have a few interesting questions come in already. Um, the first one um, talks, uh, is, talks about how all three of you have chosen career paths that are not very common. So what actually inspired you to, uh, in your journey or, and to, to basically pursue the professions that you all have? Um, can I maybe ask uh, Marsha to begin and then we can go around? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. You know, I did always know that I loved writing. I wanted, I knew I wanted to be a writer um, from York, actually, from a, a court, the first creative writing course that I took. Um, but I didn't know, I didn't really think about screenwriting. I think it just felt very far away. And like, I, you know, I'm from London, Ontario originally. And so there's no industry there. So I didn't know anybody in the business. I wasn't seeing that. So when I was thinking about being a writer, I was thinking about, you know, like, you know, journalism or, or writing a book or whatever. Um, and it was actually a friend of mine asked me, if I could, this is, seems so random. I'm not even sure why he asked me, but he asked me if I could look up how to get the rights to a book to make it into a film. And in the process of basically Googling and trying to figure out how you would do that, because I had no idea, it just occurred to me, like, why did I never think of being a screenwriter? Like, you know, at, at this time when I was young, I was quite, uh, I was a, really a book reader, but in my, as I'd gotten older, I became like kind of obsessed with television. And I was like, I'm obsessed with television. I'm a writer, you know, why have I not done this? And then I just, so I just started to research. Um, but I do think to myself now, often as I'm doing it, uh, I wonder what made me feel like it was possible. And I don't have an answer to that. I don't know where I got this like belief that somehow it was going to happen. I think what I felt was, um, that I needed to try. And like, if I gave up on it before I ever tried, I would always wonder, I would always wonder what could have happened. So I was like, you know, I need to give it a real try, give it my all. And then if it doesn't work out, it doesn't, but I, that I would be able to maybe move on and get a more conventional job. But I was like, I need to go for it first. Thanks, Marcia. Sharon? Yeah. Um, yeah, for me, I mean, my path was not straight at all. I mean, I did start with uh, out of side of York, English and communications, and I went right into book publishing, which is really what I wanted. I loved writing. I loved, I was really intrigued by that whole world. And the one thing I will say, and, and I had many sort of twists and turns, and I went, went from book publishing to tech very quickly, only because I really just ended up, everything that I did followed my nose, followed my passion, whatever was happening. So um, I'm dating myself, but in the, you know, in, in the early 90s, um, you know, there was a sort of tech boom, or later 90s with tech boom and everything. And so I was really interested in what was going on there, and I really wanted to sort of hop on that wagon. And, um, and I, what I recognize is from my studies, is that there, that there isn't a straight line, that whatever really excites you, answer your call to that in whatever form. So starting the big push really came out of my desire and need to recognize that uh, I had struggles as I was building other types of companies, but I noticed that there was this bias and I wasn't sure, I didn't even have a name for it. I didn't even know if it was a bias. I was thinking, is this me? Um, things feels a little bit off. But as I was going on and on and building all these types of businesses, I was speaking to other women and building up my network and recognizing there is more to this than just me. This is actually systemic and I wanna do something about it. So my nose led me to again, to the next passion, which was really supporting and helping, uh, you know, women led businesses get through this chasm of, of lack of investment of lack of support. And, um, and, and I always say that to my, my teenage daughters as well. It's like, just, I know it sounds, everybody's heard it before, but really do find and follow your passion and wherever that will take you. So whether you start somewhere in the university in a different course, it doesn't mean that you have to go down that path. You could completely, you know, it's more exciting when the twists and turns come. Thanks, Sharon. Darren? So I was a, a typical case of becoming what I saw in life. So both my parents were teachers. My grandmother was a teacher. My older sister was a teacher. So I became a teacher. 
And within the first year, I just realized that it wasn't what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I was very fortunate. I was swimming with a master swim team, just, you know, um, in terms of a hobby. And one of the swimmers was a firefighter. So he suggested that I apply to become either a firefighter or a police officer, just because of my uh, athletic background when I was in university and younger. Um, so I just happened to apply to the fire department. Uh, 2,500 people applied and they hired 16 and I was one of them. So it was just uh, a very lucky um, coincidence. And then just, uh, I, I looked for a way that I could compete that was different than the fire. So the fire service is, is pretty much built on a seniority-based system. And um, so you move up the ranks based on how long you're in the fire service and you're able to compete at more of an incident command um, level or a tactical level. So I looked for a way that I could differentiate myself from the other candidates and that was education. So I really took a lot of courses and that's how I looked different on, on paper than the people I was competing against for a chief officer position. Thanks, Darren. So we have our next question uh, coming from uh, Roan, and she's talking about what kind of steps did you take to build confidence in yourself during your career journeys? And if you ever have had moment of self-doubt, how did you overcome them? Who wants to tackle that first? I'm happy to. <laughs> Um, absolutely. Self-doubt. I don't think there, I'd be surprised if anyone on this panel hasn't had self-doubt or uh, fear or any of those things. Uh, failure and fear and self-doubt are sort of the process of trying to figure out yourself and understand what feels good, what doesn't feel good, what you learn from and so on. So confidence is, um, is an ever, in every, every day is something that can come up and you can kind of uh, approach it. So for me, when I Think about confidence is I throw myself into it. it's like the it's the mirror image of fear <laughs> I have to face my fear and then get through it and that's where I feel most confident um, because it's just it's the it's the space between the decision and doing is this is this is is where confidence kind of like rears or lack of confidence rears its ugly head the minute you just say yes to things yes you're scared yes you're all of these things but then you you build that confidence to be sitting in that arena and at that table and be able to take charge of whatever it is that you want to take charge of. And, uh, and don't be afraid to fail because that's where you learn the most. Thanks, Sharon. Darren or Marcia, do you want to add anything to it? I'll go next. Um, uh, well, I think there, there are two things. One, um, I actually have these uh, like sticky notes on my walls in my office right now, I'm looking at them in front of me. And the first one said is from a, it's from a poem. And it says, uh, stop asking, am I good enough? Ask only, am I showing up with love? And I, I always do that before I'm about to like do something where like, I'm gonna be nervous. Like it's not to think like, I'm just going there to bring my, I'm bringing my best self. And that kind of has to be enough. Like I can't really control anything but that. So I always like read that quote and I feel like whether, I'm not sure it gives me confidence, but it definitely calms me down and like allows me to like enter whatever room. And the other thing was I took a leadership workshop and um, this kind of touches on something that I think both, both Sharon and, and Darren said, which was about, it was like, I am a leader for all of these reasons. And it wasn't because I'm a showrunner, you know, it could be any number of things, all these different ways in which you lead in your life. Like she was like, I'm a leader because I'm a single mother. I'm a leader because, you know, I like do this or do that. So that also gave me a lot of confidence to think not just so specifically about like my title or reaching this height and that would make me a leader and that would give me confidence but rather to look at my life as a whole and find confidence in the thing and all of the things that i had accomplished um and so i i do all of these kinds of steps because i have self-doubt all the time you know even now but um but it, those things are kind of what helped me push through it and and you know get through the day. <laughs> Marcia, Darren? So studies show that uh, women have to be asked seven times before they step up for a specific opportunity. But the thing is, what happens if nobody asks you the question in the first place? You'll never get that opportunity. So uh, a friend I remember said, 
Um, I'm much like every pool that I walk by, I jump in the deep end and you have no choice but to swim or you will drown, right? And I don't wanna say that I do that blindly because there's certain opportunities or, or things that I know that won't be successful. So I choose not to jump in those pools. Um, but uh, I think what you just have to do is, is really truly believe in yourself and know that it's going to be a lot of um, time, effort, dedication, and it's not going to feel good. But if you survive, <laughs> then there's, <laughs> there's the, uh, the positive end of it, which is, is professional development, personal development, and, and hopefully success in whatever realm that looks like. Thanks, Erin. Uh, our next question actually is coming for Darren uh, from Natalie D. Uh, she's starting her fire training journey in May. And she would like to ask you is knowing what you know now, in being, in being the position you're in now, what would you tell your younger self who was starting out on your professional journey as a firefighter? So I'm going to try and make this so it's relevant to everyone, not just people that are in the fire service world, but keep in mind when you're entering any sort of profession, generally you're working in groups of, of teams. And so I think you need to really be honest about where your skill sets lack and then reach out to your colleagues because certainly the only way the team will succeed is if uh, you yourself develop the necessary skills. So I would suggest uh, when you go through the process, you become a firefighter, you acknowledge where your weaknesses are and it could be knowledge or it could be skills and then ask for help within the team. Um, and then um, in terms of what would I tell my younger self? Um, just, uh, I think, enjoy the journey, right? Um, because we're so, we rush so much to get to whatever that goal is that we don't enjoy the journey. And that's the most important part. Sharon and Marsha, if anyone is interested in starting careers related to what you are doing, what, what advice would you give to them? Sharon? Sure. Yeah. Um, so starting career, uh, well, within tech specifically and more, 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 sorry, within tech generally and specifically within sort of investments. So I'm more on the venture capital and um, side of things. Um, again, like I said, you know, I didn't take a straight path, so it, I can't you know, give you a prescription for it. However, the, the best places to do that, there are, you know, different types of like with any network, with any industry, with any, you know, either there are um, um, organizations that you can take a look into uh, um, the angel networks to learn a little bit more about uh, venture capital to understand more about you know different types of uh, journals that speak specifically to the tech industry and the startup community like beta kit and um, startup canada and so many others uh, you know google's your best friend to really understand those elements but um, to you know part of you know living in the tech world obviously it's just become our world it's just almost everything is tech right now so you know getting a little bit more closer to understanding what, what does it take to uh, build a business, to understand sort of all the levers that are, in, uh, that are in, in, integrated into schooling is definitely one of it, but there's always great opportunities to do internships. So I really, I really encourage uh, to find out other, other, there are so many businesses that are offering some paid internships, some not, but it gives you sort of a hands-on experience to really understand whether this is right for you and um, yeah, and, and then just sort of feel through where, where you best lie and what your specific skill sets could add to that particular industry. Thanks, Sharon. Marsha? Um, I think that uh, this kind of touches on something that Sharon said earlier, but like networking is, is incredibly important. Um, and so I think you want to start to develop your network and it's not, and there's like different levels, you know, like you want to, you want to have a network of people who are, are at the same level that you're at. You want to have somebody to grow with and you never know where people are going to end up, but you also want, I think there's like a comfort in just being, you know, networking with people who are, you know, just like you, but I think you also want to push yourself and go for someone who's like more in a leadership position or whatever, you know, the worst thing that can happen is that they won't answer or they'll say no. And that's not the worst thing that could happen. You know, I always, like, I think what Sharon said about thinking about what you have to offer is very good advice. You know, when I was reaching out to strangers to get my first opportunity, I was like, you know, I work very hard. 
And I know that if this person gives me an opportunity that they are not going to regret it. And I'm going to go and I'm going to work as hard as I possibly can. And then that's only going to make them look good. And that's how I gave myself the confidence to reach out to people I didn't know and ask them. And I said, you know, I have a car and a license. My other stri- important strengths uh, when you're going to be like a production assistant. Um, so I think that's really important. And I think in terms of your network, uh, if you're a writer, your network of writers, that can just really help you. Um, get your material ready. So you're not, you're having just an outside perspective on your work, someone to give you notes before you have to get to the level of sending it to an agent or to a company. It can just really help to have feedback. So that's something um, like looking for a writer's group or get, just getting in a group of other writers to workshop um, is really, really important as well. Thanks, Marcia. Um... And then our our next question is around burnout and self-care. How do you, what are your regimens to help ensure resiliency and some self-care so that just so you can avoid burnout in your daily lives? Literally, but Darren, but fighting fires. How do you make sure you don't burn yourself? Have a burnout yourself. So, um, and and often I, I know that my answer is not always appreciated, but I think uh, at least where in my position, a work-life balance is just, it's not possible. Um, So I think you just have to acknowledge that. And then, so if that's what you're looking for, you really need to look at what profession you're getting into and certainly what level um, within the organization that you're going to move to. Because, um, and I mentioned this earlier, in terms of uh, a fire chief, I have an organization that's running all day, every day. Um, and things are happening all the time, whether it's internal issues or response related issues. So I'm, I'm heavily involved, but I chose that because I love it and it's a passion of mine. So it's, it's not something that I regret or resent. It's something that's part of the job and I love it. I embrace it because I'm very passionate about what I do. But if work-life balance is, um, important to you, you really need to look at what what the profession has to offer you. And and so good point on the self-care though, in terms of eating healthy, um, you know, obviously exercising and, and getting enough sleep, those are key for any role that you're going to be in, any profession that you're in is self-care it is important. But in terms of is is your work life going to be very um present in your personal life, that's where you need to make some decisions as you kind of move through those doors of opportunity. Thanks, Darren. Sharon? Um, I think that's, uh, you framed it beautifully, Darren, and I think I was going to say in other uh, industries, and certainly mine, we're not saving lives, essentially. So, I mean, if you're not on the table um, saving lives or in fires, there's, there's a perspective that you have to take and say, listen, Life is about, you know, a balance in some aspects and recognizing where you are in your own world. So I, with that caveat, and I'm glad that you spoke of that, Darren, because I, I would uh, completely, uh, you know, recognize that, that differentiation. But to, to realize, listen, when, they're, when you're working really hard, you get really sort of narrow focused, you have these blinders on. But that also can be really uh, a detriment to actually your end vision and your end goal. So if you keep going so fast, like a racehorse down, you may not actually see what's what's on either side of you, and that actually could help you in your in you know in your movement going forward. So I always say like um, organize myself in certain ways. Like and here's a tactical sort of thing. I pick one day of the week where I'm like, this is my day to just answer emails or do this. You know, I have sort of my one day. This is the next day is just meetings. So I'm not overly, and then there's blocks of time where I say nobody can talk to me (laughs) during this time. And you kind of have to figure out your own ebb and flow of how you want to work and the best way you want to kind of live every day. Because at the end of the day, you know, it's work, it's great, it's wonderful, it's, it's supportive, but it's, we're not, we're not saving lives in these ways, but we're, we're adding to our own life when we do something uh, that's, that's helpful to us and balancing for us. Thanks, Sharon. Do you have anything to add, Marcia? Um, I will say that being a showrunner is also um, not the best choice for work-life balance. 
Um, you know, and this, you know, I think Darren said, you know, to enjoy the journey and it's true, you know, there's a time when you're a writer, when you're building, where you just go to work and you spend however many hours just coming up with ideas and creating, and then you do get to go home and have a life. And that is actually a very wonderful time. <laughs> um, and, you know, and I think we can just be like, oh, I want to be a show and I want to have my own show and forget like all of the benefits that come to that period leading up to it. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's really something to think about um, how how demanding it is. Um, what I do, I I do meditate. Um, I just think it's important. Uh, but one thing that I did when I became here's the thing: before I was a television writer, writing was like my hobby. So that was like the thing I did on like the side to be happy and and you know what I mean. It was like my my side joy, and then it became my job. So I needed to find a new hobby. So this is like, I think very important. And so I started to take uh, dance classes because it's just like it's exercise. You're not thinking because you're concentrating on the choreography, just like something to get out of your head, something for that you have of your own and something that there's no pressure to be the best at. It's just for fun. It's just, you know, it's just something for yourself. So I think having hobbies are very, is very, very important. Um, otherwise you can really get tunnel vision at work. When you love your job, when you love your work, it's very easy to just let it take over your life. So you need to find those other things you love as well. Thanks, Marcia. As you're wrapping up, I would like to invite uh, Lily back uh, so we can have a final round of comments. Lily, welcome back. Hi, thank you so much. And you guys, this Q&A was dynamite. And thank you to Mini for co-hosting. You guys are amazing. A huge thanks to Darren to Marsha, to Sharon for everything. Um, there's another webinar coming up for those of you who, who love this series. And I, I don't know if Manit's already run you through it, but I'm gonna tell you about it just one more time very quickly. It's going to be called Moving Forward, How Two Years of COVID is Impacting the Canadian Real Estate Industry. And it's taking place on March 24th from noon to one. Uh, and that is going to be pretty riveting for me, I gotta tell you. <laughs> but, um, but, I, but just very quickly, thank you again. Thank you to everybody in the room for your amazing questions for your engagement. I, one of the things that I always say during these things is that, you know, during this period of Zoom webinars, those of you who are in the audience, I, we can feel you. We know you're there and we really honor and appreciate what you've brought to this webinar, along with, of course, our distinguished guests. Thank you for your wisdom, for your insights. Happy International Women's Day. We're so proud of you and so proud to share this space with you. Take care.